concerned. He's left with but one ship, and that ship is rowing now too. And it comes finally to the island or the peninsula of the wonderful nymph Calypso. Now this is the first of the three nymphs that he's going to meet. She is the nymph of lust and this kind of uh, physical animal uh, sensuality, and she converts men into swine. Well, Odysseus, uh, not knowing where they were, sends a couple of his men ashore, and the goddess, uh, the nymph, uh, Calypso, uh, pardon me, uh, Circe, Circe of the braided locks, who is weaving a tapestry, turns them into swine. The god Hermes, guardian and guide to souls, uh, of souls to the uh, mortal life, comes to Odysseus and he says, you are in trouble here. And I'm going to give you something that will protect you. Just like the feather that was given to the boys, he gives a, a weed, a, a piece of um, a plant called moly to Odysseus. And he says, now you keep this with you and it will protect you against her magic. And when she begins to uh, <coughs> approach you, draw your dagger and threaten her. And she will then submit. She will invite you to her bed, go. And she will then transform your men back into men again and uh, give you directions for the rest of your journey. Here we have Odysseus arriving. And here are his poor men turned into pigs. And they say, look what's happened to us. Here is uh, Circe in terror of the um, dirk or dagger that he has drawn. And this figure, I think, is a beauty. Here you have the woman's magic and the men's ma male magic in conflict. Now he has met up with a woman whom he can't just push around. This is his first experience of the female who has to be met face to face, not conquered so that he's on top, but face to face. And this is the problem he has to learn in this story, that the real masculine, manly character is not that of possession of woman and conquest of woman, but one of matching in discourse and in relationship in an appropriate way the power of the feminine principle. Well, what she does is now introduce him to the voyage to the underworld. She is now in the role of Spider-Woman in the last story. She tells him what the dangers are that he's going to have to face and how to go to the underworld to learn something about his true destiny and character. <coughs> the first, uh, she's down, he's down now in the underworld, and uh, she has told him he has to make sacrifices of a certain kind, and with this he brings about uh, the uh, coming toward him of all of the spirits down there. Now they are twittering ghosts for the most part. The first uh, person whom he re meets and recognizes is one of his own men, Alpinor, who has uh, just recently died, and uh, Odysseus here meets him. But the most important encounter, and the encounter with the only figure who really is a three-dimensional figure down here, all the others are twittering shades, is with the great sage Tiresias. Now this is not Tiresias but it is a representation of a uh, philosopher. Uh, it's a, uh, a Hellenistic or Alexandrian work showing a Greek philosopher, and it seems to me to represent the quality of this figure, uh, Tiresias. The story briefly of Tiresias is that he was once out in the forest wandering, and he saw two great serpents copulating, and he placed his staff between the two and was himself turned into a woman. And he lived as a woman for eight years, and after that time, he was in the forest again, placed his uh, uh, staff between two copulating serpents who he came upon, and he was turned back into a man. So here was one who had been a woman in part of his life and a man in another part of his life, and so represented the androgyne, or the union of the pairs of opposites. And this is the great revelation that Odysseus was to receive here, that the male and female are equals of opposites, so to say. Um, now, the curious thing that happened with Tiresias after that curious adventure was, after his death and he was in uh, the Olympia with the gods, there was an argument going on between Zeus and Hera, the great king of the gods, and his spouse, as to who enjoyed uh, sexual intercourse the more, the male or the female. Well, they said, um, 
We're each on one side of this thing. Who, who can tell? Oh, said uh, somebody, uh, how about sending for Tiresias? So they sent for Tiresias and asked Tiresias. Well, Tiresias answers, well, the woman. Well, for some reason or other, Hera took this very badly and struck him blind. And Zeus, in, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> thanks, gave him the opposite uh, faculty, namely of prophetic vision. When your eyes are closed to the outside forms of the world, you become aware of the inward dynamics of the world, and so it was with Tiresias. So he became a great prophet. But the point of him in this particular adventure of Odysseus is that he represents the kind of wisdom and uh, life knowledge that comes from a recognition of the identity in two aspects of the one life as male and female. So with this message, he goes back to Circe. And again, she plays the role of Spider-Woman and tells him of his next adventure, that he may go now to the island of the sun, her father, just as our boys went to the sun for their power. But again, she tells him what the dangers are, and one of the dangers is to be the clashing rocks. Well, he need not go through that. He may go through two other dangers, and they are, first, the danger of the sirens. These uh, spirits who um, sing the song of uh, the universe and distract the man from his uh, voyage and its direction and then uh, lure him onto the rocks. Odysseus did not want to uh, be lured onto the rocks, neither did he want to miss the song of the sirens. And so he uh, had uh, wax put into the ears of his men, and he had, so that they would row past that song, he had himself lashed to the mast without wax in his ears, and hearing the song of the sirens, he finally went past them. You might say he had it both ways. He went between the pair of opposites. His next adventure was to go between a rock on which there was a, this uh, fantastic figure, um, um, Scylla, a woman, the, the lower part of whose body was a kennel of barking dogs, uh, that uh, consumed sailors wrecked on the shore, and on the opposite side to her was the great whirlpool of Charybdis. And Odysseus was to sail between these two opposites, the rock and the whirlpool. Later, Hellenistic interpretation of this symbol interpreted the rock as representing the rock of logic or reason, and the whirlpool as the whirlpool of emotion and mystical madness, and we must go between. Just as in the first talk, I spoke of the problem of uniting the worlds of, uh, of uh, the Olympian Apollo and the Dionysian Dionysos, so here we must unite or go between the two. Well, in this way, he finally does come to the land of the son, her father. He himself, you will remember, identified and had identified himself with the ram, which was the uh, vehicle of the son, and so now he comes, as it were, to his own inward light. This problem of identification with the transcendent light is that of the yogi in India, the one who, through his yoga, has released himself from all the bondage of the lunar world, the world of uh, the weaving and unweaving moon, and gone to the pure, unadulterated light of the sun. Now, if Odysseus had been an oriental yogi, he might very well have stayed on the island of the sun. There was a taboo there, namely that you should not kill and eat the oxen of the sun. A perfectly appropriate taboo for this place or this uh, mythological area. Namely, if you are to identify yourself fully with the spirit of the sun, what do you want with earthly food, namely the food of oxen or meat of any kind? So, Odysseus, is determined not to kill the oxen of the sun. On the other hand, he goes to sleep. That is to say, his earthly character takes over, he loses his concentration, and his men kill the uh, cattle of the sun. The revenge is a complete shipwreck, and the last boat is wrecked. Here's a very early uh, ceramic piece from the ninth century representing the wreckage of a ship. And I presented here to represent this situation. All of his men are killed, 
and Odysseus is the only survivor, and he grabs a piece of the wreckage and now is torn on the current right back swiftly over the course that he has already uh, traveled. This again is a standard motif in spiritual uh, experience. Namely, you bring yourself to a great tension uh, through asceticism and austerities, <clears throat> and then you break it. I mean, some little distraction or something can break it. And all of the repressed emotions and desires that were kept down now come soaring back, and you're ripped right back. It's an old story in the lives of yogis, how such a ripping back can take place. Well, so that's what happened with Odysseus. He had reached the term of his journey, so to say, and is now on the way back. The goal of his life, the goal of his story, is not to remove him from the world, but to bring him back in proper relationship to a life in the world as a decent husband.